Hi everybody, welcome to our training on the TEAS. This is going to be a part one for a deep dive on data internals. Uh, this is part of the cure for the past summit blues that you may have. Past summit has been over now for several months. Uh, the next one is coming up in November. Uh, but this is also something to give you an idea of the, the content that we put together and actually gets presented at the past summit. So if you enjoy what you see today, uh, definitely go out there and register for the summit in 2014. It's going to be back in Seattle. They've got the call for speakers open right now. Uh, and just so you know, this was a 500 level talk that I did at the summit. So this is, we're going to try and go pretty deep. Uh, like I said, try and get your questions together and we'll answer as many as we can, that we can uh, as we have time for it towards the end. Uh, so yeah, I, I left this slide in there for you just so you know. Uh, if you're at the summit, you're going to get a nice little slide letting you know to silence your cell phones. So everybody out there, shh, no cell phones. Anyway, so speaker introduction. Uh, who am I? My name's Bradley Ball. Uh, my previous experience, the uh, cool stuff I've done, uh, I was DBA for the U.S. Army, the Executive Office of the President. Uh, I was a senior SQL DBA staff specialist for public supermarkets in the great southeast of uh, the United States. Uh, currently, I'm the Data Platform Management Lead for Pragmatic Works. That means I get to uh, manage a lot of DBAs and business intelligence professionals that are really, really brilliant people. and uh, I get to do a lot of project management oversight with their projects, and I get to work closely with clients. So uh, it's nice that I get to be active and still work in the field. Uh, I'm currently a VTSP for Microsoft for the greater Northeast, and uh, I think recently the South as well. So if you call Microsoft and ask for some help on how you can utilize SQL Server, I may be someone who ends up on a call with you. I'm an ITP DBA for 2005-2008. I blog at SQLBalls.com. On Twitter, I'm at SQLBalls. My email is bball at pragmaticworks.com. So again, if you have questions, we don't uh, have time to get to them, please feel free to shoot me an email. Take me might take me a little wait to or a little time to respond, depending on how busy my day is, but I, I will get back to you. Uh, and the only book that I've written so far that's been published is I had chapter 14 on page and row compression for the uh, 2012 uh, Pro Practices. Great book. There's about 12 different authors on there. Uh, it's a really interesting one. Go to Amazon, take a look at it, and, um, and see if you might enjoy it. Oh, and I accidentally clipped my hyperlink. Oh, and just so you know, this deck is already up, and all the demos associated with it, uh, except for the ones on Hecaton, uh, they are up and online on my blog. So if you go to SQLBalls.com, go to my resources page. Um, every presentation I've ever done, there's a deep dive on data internals that I delivered at the past summit. Uh, the deck and the demos are currently unchanged. Now for day two, we will have some, some a little bit different content, and I will get those up before the presentation. So just a quick warning, uh, I will try and be funny, and it's a picture of Carrot Top because I'm going to try. I, I don't promise that I'll succeed. We will go very fast because there's a lot to cover, and I want to make sure that we get it all in before we get to the questions. We at least want to make sure we get through data records. Uh, we're going to go deep. That's the point of this talk. It's 500 level one. So once again, keep in mind that um, the recording will be put up and online after we finish this, so you'll be able to go back and watch it again if you need to. And uh, I have this at the summit just because whenever we're at the summit, I like to tell people that if you think this session isn't for you, your time is very valuable. I appreciate you spending it with me, and I uh, really appreciate you taking your time, probably a lunch break or a morning break, to spend it with us now. Uh, and if it isn't for you, it's never going to hurt my feelings if you get up and leave. So our agenda, we're going to talk about records, pages, extents, allocation units, IAM uh, chains, and allocation bitmaps. Uh, day two, we're going to have a little bit more because uh, I don't think we're going to get all the way through this today. So we'll end up covering whatever we don't finish and some additional things on day two. And we're going to try and have a little bit of fun. I, I'm serious, a little bit of fun. I'll, I'll try to keep this as uh, not lame as possible. So the first thing that we need to start out with with DBAs is we need to understand that as DBAs, we often learn backwards. If you watch Godzilla backwards, uh, it's not a horror movie at all. It's a heartwarming tale about a giant lizard who helps rebuild a half burnt down city and then moonwalks into the ocean. Who doesn't love a giant moonwalking lizard? It's, it's wonderful. Um, but as DBAs, we often start out our career learning backwards. Uh, we go to a job and we, they go, hey, here's a database. And when we look inside that database, we see tables. Um, we probably learn about views and how we can abstract those tables to be able to give information out to the users that's easier for them to consume. Uh, we probably start to learn about clustered indexes, or if we're lucky, we already know about them. Uh, eventually, we learn about non-clustered indexes and all the different things that that entails. But learning about this backwards is kind of like learning about how a car works and saying, well, it's 
pulled by an invisible, invisible magical unicorn. Uh, it's, it's just the wrong way to learn things. We don't start out doing that. We know how the internals of a car work. I'm not a mechanic, but if I was, I need to know more than the blue thing connects to the pink thing. I need to know that probably somewhere in there there's an air filter, um, that there's gears, that there's piston heads, that that's a nitrous system hooked to something else. I need to know what is actually going on in this car. And part of the reason is because that knowledge conveys confidence. It makes it easier for when I talk to my end users, to my developers, to the business owners, to my managers, for them to know that I actually know what's going on with SQL Server. So it's important for our job, for us to learn the internals of SQL Server, so that way we know what's going on. Because whenever something goes wrong, it's going to help us to be able to go, hey boss, this is the way things work, we've got this problem, and we can start to dissect it from there and figure out what's going on and what's causing our issues. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by learning forwards. Uh, this is something I like to call the um, hierarchy pyramid of data internals for SQL Server. This is the way that we actually store things. We start out with records. We then go to pages. We then have a made-up concept called extents. Extents are a contiguous group of eight pages. And the number eight is very important in SQL Server, and we'll get into that in a moment. And from extents, we have allocation bitmaps, and then we have IAM chains and allocation units. And understanding the hierarchy of how our data is actually stored is going to help us understand a lot of the ways that SQL Server works. Now, there's some terminology that I want to make sure that we get out up front, uh, that we all are on the same page. So I put together this little definition slide. Uh, first off, a null. A null is not empty. It's an unknown data value. What actually happens when we define a null is we temporarily grab some memory buffers and we put it in the null space. Uh, when we have a bit, it's binary one or zero. There's no numbers other than one or zero, and we, we use as a collection of ones and zeros to be able to tell us what has actually occurred. Bytes. There are eight bits in a byte. And remember, that number eight is very important because that's how we store a lot of code mathematically in computers. Hexadecimal. This is called base 16, or hex mathematical. Uh, it's, a, it's something that you would find in computer science. A hex pair equals one byte. So if we have two characters that each equal a hex pair, that's always going to equal one byte of storage in your SQL server. Byte swapping. Byte swapping is the process when we have to switch things from left to right uh, to, uh, to right to left to be able to see, I'm sorry, we switch them from right to left to left to right. Sometimes our computers read backwards, and the reason is little EDM processors. If you work on Windows, which all of us probably do, little EDM processors actually read things from right to left. There were two types of processors that were originally invented. Um, Motorola and Unix and, and all of those things have uh, big EDM processors which read from right to left. The little EDM processors, which are Intel, which all of our Windows operating systems run on, run read right to left. Now there are some times that we're going to have to flip bits to be able to, uh, to decode something to be able to determine the values that are actually stored in our SQL Server. And this is why we have to flip those bits. It's because that's the way our central processing unit actually reads that information. So we've got to flip it back so that way our human brains can understand it. A bitmap. You're going to hear this term a lot. It's just a fancy made-up word. It's made of ones and zeros, and it means something secretly uh, to the developers inside of Microsoft. They say, this is what these patterns of ones and zeros are going to mean, and this is how we're going to read them, and then that's going to mean something for our application. I've got that secret decoder ring down there at the bottom, because that's basically what a bitmap is. is it's a map that has data that tells us something, but we've just got to decode it so that way we can understand what it is. An example of this would be the word go. If I take the word go, and I, the letter G would convert in hex to 0x47. O would convert to 0x4f. In binary, you can see the way that, that hex 0x47 would translate, and the same for 0x4f. You can see there's a little bit of difference just in the positioning of the zeros and one of the ones. We would then translate that binary to ASCII, and we would get the letter G and the letter O. So if we store Go in our database, we've got to store it in hex, and then whenever we read it, we flip it to binary and then to ASCII. If we want to store the number 30, 
I'm sorry, uh, the number 3 in SQL Server, we're going to see that stored as 30. In hex, it will be 0, 3. And in a bitmap, we'd have a whole lot of zeros and then a 1 and a 1 in the way that we convert that hex to binary. Remember that 0 is not null and 1 is null in some of the cases that we're looking at. We're also going to use a couple commands to be able to look at the internals for SQL Server. DBCC commands. DBCC INV. DBCC INV allows us to be able to transverse the chain of objects that we have uh, that are chained together to be able to form all the pages that are in a table, in a clustered index, or in a non-clustered index. Uh, DBCC page is actually going to allow us to see the contents of what is actually stored on a data page. There's different types of dump styles that we're going to use. Mainly, we're going to use dump style 3, which is going to give us a detailed, friendly description. And then DBCC trace on 3604. This is going to allow us to see the output of DBCC page. If we didn't put 3604 on, it would just say command completed successfully. There's also a way that you can specify the results of DBCC page to go to a table that doesn't require DBCC trace on 3604. My buddy Wayne Sheffield and I were talking about that this weekend. And uh, Wayne showed it to me. But uh, in some cases, it, it doesn't offer up exactly what I want for this presentation. So we're going to stick with just 3604 and DBCC page. So we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to start at records. And we're going to slowly move our way up. The first type of records we have are data records. Now this is where our data is physically stored. Uh, data records can be stored in different formats, though. You can have sparse records, and you can have compressed data records. Remember, these are, regular, these are different than regular data records. What we're looking at is a data record. These will be the leaf level of clustered indexes. We can have a unique fire. We can have non-unique indexes. Um, data records are sometimes called records or slots or rows. When we look at data on a page, we're going to look at a zero-based array, and we're going to look at slots to be able to find the data that we, we want to look at for our demos. As you look at the makeup of our records, we start out with our tag bytes. We have status A and status B tag bytes. The front part of our tag bytes will tell us a lot of information about what type of record, data record we're actually looking at. After that, we have our null bitmap offset. This gives us one column, uh, one byte for every column that we have in our table and helps us understand whether those records are null or not. If everything in our fixed data region was null, we could skip forward to our null bitmap. In between our null bitmap offset and our null bitmap is our fixed length data. The fixed length data is the portion of a record that stores anything that is a fixed length. Integers, chars, inchar, date time. There's a whole host of things, float, a lot of different things that are fixed length data. Those fixed length data types will always be sitting there towards the very beginning of the record. We next have our null bitmap offset. And the null bitmap offset has one record, uh, sorry, has one byte per row in our database, uh, in our, I'm sorry, in our row that tells us whether the row is null or not. This is especially important when it comes to our variable length data, because if that data is null, there are some times that we will not actually get a row stored on page, but we'll get into that a bit later. We have our variable offset array. Our variable offset array actually stores the amount of length that it takes to get from the offset array to the next variable length data record. And there's one stored per record that we have in this row. Forwarding, forwarding rows and forwarding records. These only occur in heaps. We're never going to get them in a clustered index. These are heap-only fields. A record is, it, this occurs when a record is updated and there's no room for the record on the current page. The page is absolutely filled to capacity. There's no room to extend the record the way it needs to, to be extended. Typically, this is going to be when we have a variable length field and we update it and we extend that amount of data. What will happen is that record has to find a new place to live. It can no longer remain on this page. So what will happen is it's going to leave something called a forwarding stub. The forwarding stub is actually going to point to the, um, the page number and the slot ID where this record will be moved to. So if you have a heap file and 
you have a non-clustered index, and it needs to go down to that heap to be able to find that record. We have to go down, find our forwarding pointer, and then it goes forward to our forwarded record. And I'll show you a demo of this a little bit later. But the thing to keep in mind is whenever you have forwarded records, you have fragmentation in your heaps. And what we can do is we can actually work to find uh, the forwarded records that we have in heaps. And starting in SQL 2008 on up, you can actually rebuild a heap to be able to get rid of all the forwarding records. Text records. This is a data record. Um, it will have a pointer to the text record uh, if the data is a log value. So a log value is a large object data value. Think of Varchar Max uh, that has more than 8,000 characters in it, a text record, image, uh, uh, var binary max will also be a log record. And what happens is that these text records will have a pointer in your regular data record that points over to the text structure that you will find for this. Um, if you have more than 4,000 bytes but less than 8,000 bytes, then what will happen is you'll have a row overflow log record, which is also going to be in text trees. Uh, a 24-byte byte pointer will always be left in the data record that points to the text tree that we need to find. Ghost records. Ghost records only occur in clustered indexes or heaps with snapshot isolation. Uh, ghost records are an optimization for the undo process of a transaction. What happens is if I do a delete operation from a bunch of rows in a table, it will go through and it will flip a bit to say that the record is currently ghosted. This is good because if the transaction has to roll back, if we deleted the entire record, we would then have to go back and rewrite the entire record. Instead, we just have to flip this bit and then we put it back into place and it's no longer a ghosted record. So this is an optimization for our redo and our undo process. So a ghost record will normally only occur in a clustered index. It can happen in a heap, but you have to have the database sitting in snapshot isolation. One thing I would say is if you want to try this out, try an experiment, um, the master database on your SQL Server instance is always in snapshot isolation. Do it locally. Don't muddy up a, a development or a production server. But you can go into, snap, uh, into the master database, you can create a heap, uh, delete, delete a record out of there, do a DBCC page to be able to take a look and actually see that a ghosted record has occurred. Space is not open up until the lazy writer is triggered. A lazy writer is triggered after the, uh, the transaction has committed and it will remove those ghosted records. Uh, the reclaimed unused space will uh, be able to you'll be able to reclaim the unused space with reorganize or rebuild operations. Version records. Version records were introduced in SQL 2005. Um, we're beginning to see a lot of fruition with version records. Uh, when they were initially introduced, they offered optimization for DML triggers. Uh, they were the basis for us to be able to have uh, um, read uncommitted uh, as also uh, snapshot isolation the online rebuild of indexes, uh, all used version records which utilize their version store in TIPDB. One of the things we're starting to see is that version records are also the reason that we're able to have read-only secondaries in always on. Uh, version records play a very, very big part in Hecaton and our ability to be able to, to keep concurrency in Hecaton. So what happens is when you have version records turned on in a database, a timestamp will be associated with your data record as well as the version record that sits in TempDB. Any transaction that enters the database that tries to access that record will go to the record that is consistent for the time that the transaction began. The data is stored in the TempDB using the version store and every one minute the version store cleanup process runs and will eject the used records out of the TempDB as long as a transaction is not actively using those records. Uh, you can actually, there's perfmon counters where you can take a look at the version store and if you insert data into a, a version table uh, or if you update it or you delete it, you'll be able to see the version store expand and you'll also be able to see the version store cleanup come every one minute and the number of records will go down. Remember that version records have a 16 byte timestamp value associated to the end of them this could cause peach splits and fragmentations in volatile tables. One of the things that you want to keep in mind is if you've got version records on the table, you're 
probably going to want to have uh, some page free space associated with that if it's a very volatile table to make sure that you don't have a lot of page, page splits operations. Other types of records. There are compressed records, page and row compressed records. I've done several presentations on page and row compression for the past summit and also for pragmatic works. If you're interested in these types of records, uh, I would encourage you to go and, and take a look at those presentations. Um, I did a deep dive for the past summit in 2011 and 2012, which covers these very much in depth. And I also have uh, a dive into compressed data internals that I did for um, pragmatic works twice, actually, that we have in our recordings. There are also allocation records, which we'll get into a bit later, sparse records, sort records, which occur in the TempDB whenever we have an order by operation, uh, whenever we have to sort data in a particular way or a merge join, uh, metadata records, and file header records. Now, one of the best explanations that I've ever seen for a record comes from Paul Randall. Uh, long ago, when I, I first put together my uh, compression presentation, I emailed Paul and said, hey, is it okay if I use this slide? He very graciously said yes. Uh, so I've, I've got a link down here. This is from one of the MCM video series on data structures uh, that the good folks over at SQL Skills put together. When the MCM uh, exam, before it was decommissioned, uh, was first introduced to the public after the 2010 PASS Summit. This is still some of the best training and content that I've ever seen out there on the web. So I really encourage you, if you've never looked at the MCM videos, uh, Google or Bing MCM preparedness videos. There's about 70 of them. They include lectures and demos. I encourage you to go download them and use them to help further your SQL learning. They're all really, really great stuff. So as Paul explained a record, we start out with our tag, our tag bytes. We have our null bitmap offset, which can point forward to our null bitmap. We have our fixed length data columns, our variable offset array, and our variable length columns. Our variable offset array will actually point forward to the end of our variable length columns and will cycle back from each point. So our first demo is how to read a data record. Now, this is a bit of a deep one, so I'm going to tell you again, remember, take a deep breath. Because what we're going to do is we're going to dissect this a bit of a time. I used to do this uh, doing a whole bunch of demos and, and then zoom it and zooming back and forth. And I found flipping through these things back and forth actually got a little confusing. So we're going to do this section by doing a, a PowerPoint, uh, a demo by PowerPoint kind of section. The very first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at our tag bytes. So I've got this SQL statement, and this script is actually in there, and the, you have the ability to download this. So if you wanted to, you could use this script to follow along and, and be able to dissect the script and make sure you got the same results. We're going to create a table, my table one. I've got an identity column, uh, a char 500 with a default of some product, a uh, char 1000 with a default description of product description, and my primary key is my ID, my integer column, and it's clustered. So if we did a DBCC page, if we weed out a lot of the, the other bits of information, this is going to be the column that we get. And this 10 right here in red, and this double zero right here in blue, these are our tag bytes, our status A and our status B. If we take the hex one zero, and we translate it to binary, and then we flip that binary, each of these values means something. Bit one is a versioning bit. It's always zero on a non-version record. The next three are representations. Uh, zero is a primary data record. One is a forwarding record. Two is a forwarding stub. Three is an index record. Four is a blob or row overflow fragment. Five is a ghost index record. Six is a ghost data record. And seven is a ghost version record. Now, I hear what you're saying. You go on balls. I don't see how bits that you explained can only be ones and zeros are one through seven, and we will get to that in a moment. The next bit tells us if there's a null bitmap. There is a null bitmap in this case for this record. Are there any variable length columns? We did not define any variable length columns. Remember, we had an identity column, which was a fixed length integer. We had two chars, a 500 and a 1,000 byte char. 
uh, there are no variable link columns currently in this data. Is there row versioning info? No, no row versioning info on this. And this last bit is not used. So how do we translate this data right over here? Well, this is how we translate it. The structure of these three bits in different orders would give us a decimal value. That decimal value would translate based off of the way that this data is associated. Zero is always zero. One will give us one, a forwarding record, one zero, and so on and so forth. And you can see that if we have all ones, that would translate to a decimal value of seven. So next up from our tag bytes is our null bitmap offset. Our null bitmap offset, as you can see, is E405. And we're going to have to flip this value as we produce the hex. So it's actually 05 E4 hex. And in decimal, it's 1,508. And if we add it up, we have my integer ID, which is four bytes. Our product name, that's a 500 uh, char character. Remember, one character in a char is equal to one byte, so we've got 500 bytes. Product description, another 1,000 char, so 1,000 bytes. So we add it up, this is 1,504 bytes. Well, where's our extra four bytes come from? We have tag bytes that are two bytes, our null bitmap offset, which is an additional two bytes, which gives us 1,508 bytes. So our null bitmap offset gives us the length of the entire record and also tells us um, how much data that we've got to transpire uh, for the entire record. Now we go to our fixed length columns. We're going to take a table and we're going to make fixed length records. We're going to make my ID an integer and my char a five. And this is a heap. And we're going to insert into a fixed record. We're just going to do one value, value one and X. You can see here's the data that we got back. This starts off with hex one. Now remember, each hex pair equals one byte. It's a four byte value, and we've got eight characters right here. So this hex one just equals decimal one, and that's what our value is. We inserted the number one. We also inserted the number x. Remember, we had a char five. So you can see we took out this entire field and a bit of this right here. We have hex five eight, which translates to binary which we then translate to ASCII, which is the letter X. So what does the value 20 mean? It translates in this to binary, and when we look at ASCII, it's nothing. It's a blank space. So that's why we got 20, 20, 20, 20 afterwards, because it's all the blank spaces. Remember, a char is a fixed length field. No matter if we put one character in there or five characters in there, we've got to take up five bytes worth of space. Since we only used one character, character for X, which is 58, the rest of this was white space. So next up is our null bitmap. We're going to use this table to take a look at our null bitmap. Uh, we're going to create a table called data record 2. I've got my ID, integer, my fixed data, a char 4, my variable length data 1, which is a bar char 6, my variable length data 2, which is a var char 6, my variable length data 3, which is a var char 6. And I'm going to insert into data record 2 my ID, my fixed data, my variable data 1, 2, and 3. And I'm going to do the number 7, 4 X's to fill up this chart all the way, and then null, null, and null. So one of the things that we can see right away is here's our null bitmap. This is hex 5, decimal 5, and that makes sense because we have five columns in our table. Hex 1C, binary 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. We flip that for 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. And the way this breaks down is fixed length data 1 column. We inserted the number seven right there, and that's in use. Fixed data two column. Remember, we put four X's in place, that's in use. Our next three varchar columns are null though. 
And so they're all labeled as one. And then this was left over from our lack of eight columns. Because remember, we have to provision eight bits in order to make a byte. And that's what we did right here. So we have these three columns left over. Now one of the differences that I found between 2005 and 2008 is they actually changed the null bit map to where when they tracked columns, it used to be zeros for nulls, and now it's ones. So if you look at some of the really great blogs that Paul Randall did or that uh, Ryan Keown and Delaney's 2008 internals book, uh, those initially had the null bitmap offset as being zeros. And so it threw it for a little bit of a loop when I sat there and I was trying to reproduce my results. So I wrote a blog on this. Um, it's not a big deal. This, this really doesn't affect performance as I see it. There was probably some internal reason where keeping the number as a one instead of a zero made things much more efficient for SQL Server. Uh, regardless, it's one of those nice little undocumented things. And that's the thing to keep in mind. This whole presentation, we're going over the structure of a data record. This could change from one release to the next. As a matter of fact, this did change from the last CTP of 2008 to the RTM of 2008, which is part of the reason that, uh, that the 2008 internals book was a little bit off on the null bitmap offset. Right now, this structure is unchanged in 2014 for a regular data record. However, that doesn't mean that by the time we go RTM with 2014 that there couldn't be some changes. So it's one of those things to sit there and look and go a little bit at a time to make sure that we, we actually understand what it is that we're getting. Now, let's do this a little bit further. Let's, let's make a change to our null bitmap. Let's update our variable length to field and we're going to put in six W's. You can see that we changed from our previous value. We still have five columns, but now we have one four hex, which becomes this in binary, which when we flip is this value, because fixed column one, we have data in that. Fixed column two, we have data in that. Variable column one, which is, I actually should change this, sorry about that. This should be one, even though this is our third column right here, is still null. We updated the second column, and this is no longer null. This one is still null. These are three left, these three are still left over from our original eight bits. So that's our null bitmap. Now we get to our variable offset array. So what we're gonna do is we're going to recreate our record exact same thing that we used before, my data record two. We're going to start out with null, 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 the value seven and four x's. No variable offset array. I often get asked the question uh, because it apparently used to matter at one point in time in one of the releases of SQL Server. Does it matter how you structure your columns? In very, very rare cases, yes, but 99% of the time, no, it doesn't. And the only time it would actually matter is if you have variable line columns that you know are going to be null, and you put them on the end of your table. Uh, what will happen is you'll always find that those variable length columns, if they are null, you don't even get a variable length array. So it'll make your data record smaller overall. So that's one thing to consider. So let's go ahead and update this the same way we did in our past demo. We're going to take my var data two, and we're going to set six of. Uh, we're going to insert six Ws into that. You can see that we've got 0, 2, 1, 5, 1B now for our variable offset array. So 0, 2 is hexed, and it's because we have two columns. Now, even though our first column in our variable length data is null, we have to now include this column because we can't get to the second column without the first one. But notice our third column, which is null, is still not there. 1, 5, 0, 0, which is hexed for 15 which is a length of 21. Remember, this is pointing forward to the data that we've actually got. So how do we add that up? Our tag bytes are two. Our null bit by offset is two bytes. Our fixed length data is eight bytes. Our null bit map is three bytes. Our variable offset array is six bytes. Our variable length column one, zero bytes, because it's null. We're not storing anything there. When we add all that up, 
we get 21 bytes, which is our value, which points to the start of our record, so that way we can read it, and then we'll come back to our variable offset array. Hex 1B is 27, and it's 27 because we added 6 W, so 21 plus 6 is 27. That's our variable offset array. Now, our variable link columns, these are actually pretty easy to understand. Uh, we're going to put three S's in var data one, six, I'm sorry, nine W's in var data two, and two B's in var data three. You can see that our null bitmap offset changed to 001A0023, 002500. And then here's our different data values. These are actually going to be pretty easy for us to translate because they're ASCII and they're the same repeating value. 05 translates to binary, which translates to ASCII to S. 57 translates to binary, which translates to ASCII to W. Hex 24 translates to ASCII to binary, which translates to ASCII to B. So all this is really interesting, but why does it matter? I mean, it's really interesting for us to take a look at internals and, and say we're learning from the ground up and now we understand what's inside our database, but how does this actually matter? So let's go to our first demo. I, I've got pretty much everything that we were doing that we would have flipped through uh, right here for you. We've already covered this in PowerPoint. So what we're going to do is the first one I want to show you is the forwarding pointer demo. We're just going to create some real quick. We're going to use our demo internal database that we would have created in the first script. We're going to create our table, DBO forward in pointer. We're going to create an identity integer. Uh, remember, this is a heap. We have to have a heap in order to have a forwarding pointer. Uh, fixed data, var, uh, my var data one, my var data two, which are both var chars. We're going to insert 50 characters, fill this up, only 500 out of 2,000, only 1,000 out of 3,000. So that way we've got extra space for us to blow one of these records up. We're going to insert 22 values into our table. We'll do DBCC trace on 3604, so we're ready when DBCC page comes along. We're going to do a DBCC IND, demo internals, table forwarding pointer, and we're going to do dump style one. What we're going to do is we're going to get all the records that exist. Right here you see our page type. Uh, that's page type 10. Page type 10 is an IAM page, which we'll probably end up covering tomorrow. Page type 1 is our data pages. So the first data page that we come to is page 293. We're going to grab that page, and we'll put it right here into a DBCC page. What we're going to do is we're going to update record number 4. You can see that we immediately start getting this data. You can see that here's slot 0, and I just realized I did not turn on zoom it. Let me grab that real quick. Cardinal sin of a presenter, not having zoom it on. I'll grab a drink of water while zoom it is loading up on my external drive. All right. So you can see right here, I've got slot zero. Now we store things as we store rock records as slots on the data page. Uh, as a zero-based array. So the very first record one is going to be slot zero. So you can see right here that my ID one is going to be our very first slot. And then you see that here's my, my column one. So let's find my column two so we can figure out what slot that we're working with. I'm sorry, my ID 4. And it should be slot 3. We come down here and look at our data, and sure enough, slot 3 has my ID 4. So let's go ahead and let's bloat this record for our column 4. Let's create a forwarded record. What we'll do is we're just going to come down here. We're going to do an update forwarding pointer, my var data 1. We're going to replicate the 1,000 times where my ID is 4. We're going to go back and do another DBCC page. And when we come down here, to slot number three, oh, 
Sorry, went a little too far. What we will find is we've got a forwarding stub. And this is the record, and it's forwarded to file 1, page 298, slot 2. You can see that slot 4 begins right here. So this is all the space that we took up on this page for this forwarding record. So if we go to page 298, slot 4, we should find our ID number 4. So let's go over to page 298, slot 0, slot 1, slot 2. And you can see that we've got a forwarded record. We scroll down to look at our data. you can see that here's my ID4. So we had to do a double hop to be able to get to this data. Why is this important? Because if we have a heap with a non-clustered index on it, and we have to go and look up data from that base table and we've got forwarded records, we're doing a double hop, which is less efficient, which causes more IOPS. And this might not be that bad if this operation runs one or two times a day, but if we're running this 5,000 times an hour, this is going to be a big performance problem for our server. Now, I know what you're thinking. Does it create a forwarding hop every single time? The answer to that is no. If we actually add some more records, extend our pages a little bit more, and then we bloat our record even more to where it falls off this page again, we only update the original pointer. There's not multiple pointers. So let's go back to page 293. If we come down to slot number three, you can see that here's our forwarding stub, and now we're pointing to page 301, slot number two. And if we go to 301, we can see that here's our forwarded record sitting at slot number two. So we won't get three hops. It'll always stay at a maximum two. So that matters for heaps and fragmentation, but it matters for SQL Server as a whole when it comes to write-ahead logging. Write-ahead logging is a concept that we'll talk about when we discuss ACID tomorrow. But write-ahead logging happens every time there's an insert, update, and delete in SQL Server. What happens is that you have to have something right out of the transaction log to be able to have that data. We make a change in memory, but that memory, that change isn't put in our data file until we do a checkpoint every one minute. So what we're going to do is create a database just called WAL Demo. We're going to use WAL Demo, and we're going to create a table. This is our My Table 1 from our examples. We're going to insert some data records. Remember our variable offset array is all uh, null at this point. We take a look. Our data page is 290. If we come down here, we can see our record as it's put in place. This one just right here. This is exactly what we've got on our PowerPoint slide. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin a transaction. I'm going to name it WAL Demo. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to update my variable link column, uh, set it to 9Ws the same way we did during our, our PowerPoint deck presentation. Uh, I'm going to do a select all from a function called FNDB log. This is an undocumented function which actually allows us to go through the transaction log and run a query. We're going to look for our name transaction so we can get our full transaction history. So I'm going to fire this off real quick. And what I'll find is that my update created a lot modify row record for my heap. If I actually scroll out to the row contents log, a lot of information in our transaction log.
you can see that here's some data that I got. Now, if I go and do a DBCC trace on 3604 and I go to page 290, let me do this in another window real quick. Here's my data record that we just updated on that page. Let me strip out some of the not so important bits. And what you can see when I get rid of this hex header is that this is the exact same record that we store on our data page. Because we have to have a physical copy of that row that's written out to our transaction log every single time. As a matter of fact, one of the most interesting things that I found about compressed records is the compressed record format writes out to the log. So we actually use less log space. But that's how this applies to the real world. So like I said, this was a 90-minute session at pass. And we start picking up speed from here. But the most important thing is we get down the initial concept of data records before we move on to pages, extents, allocation bitmaps, IAM chains, and allocation units. So we're already at 11.51, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and start looking through the questions to see if we've got any. So let's see. Um, oh, okay, I had a couple sound checks. Let's see, will the PowerPoint be available after? Uh, yep, it is already posted on SQLBalls.com. If you go to SQLBalls.com, go to the resource page, uh, look under the presentations, you'll find a deep dive on data internals. Uh, at some time, can you describe the impact of using Unicode on storage? Uh, by Don, absolutely Don. So uh, using Unicode, uh, say an in chart or an in bar chart, will double the size of your records if you're storing your data in English characters. So Unicode, uh, if you need to work with other countries, sometimes you have to have your data stored in Unicode. Um, and there's actually a pretty good uh, diagram on the Books Online page that tells you by language how much extra data is stored in Unicode. I think Japanese utilizes 80% um, of Unicode characters, whereas English uses only 50. Uh, one of the things that I go into on my data compression uh, presentation is that if you compress data, you automatically strip out the extra white bits that Unicode puts in place with the exception of one character, uh, which is a byte that is utilized to be able to say what uh, language you're actually utilizing in Unicode. How do records hex binary uh, bitmap in T-SQL? Uh, how to get record sets? Uh, well, hopefully, um, Chen, I going through the presentation right there, Hopefully that's, that's laid out pretty good. I also did a, a blog series on uh, BIDN about this. A couple of them ended up on SQLBalls.com. I'm probably going to put them all over there uh, at some point in time. But if, if you have any more questions about that, please feel free to get the deck or look at the blog series that I did. Uh, I actually have links to hex editors um, as well as ASCII conversions. There's a couple free online that I utilized. Uh, so that way everything that I did was, was online. Uh, can you use this to fix patients? Uh, let's see, uh, great question from Lee. I mean, in the old days, back in the mid-80s, we sometimes had errors that porting pointers pointed to the wrong page, uh, and then we could would have to fix it. So does that happen much anymore, or would you have to go in and fix it by hand? Um, I, I have not seen that happen. Uh, I, I think that all the bugs that created that have been corrected. Uh, however, I would be very hesitant to cracking open the file and doing anything by hex uh, because there are some internal flags that once you do that and you muck around with the hex, um, what it will do is it will let uh, Microsoft know that it's, it's no longer a supported database. And what you'll do is if you ever have problems with your database where you have to call into Premier Support, um, they're going to have you do a couple things, send them some basic information, and if they see it's not supported, they'll say, sorry, you did this. And what you'll have to do is export all your tables and all your data out before it can be supported. So the, the good news is uh, the porting pointer problems no longer occur in newer versions of SQL Server. Um, and if they have, I haven't heard anyone complain about them in, in quite some time. I've never had an issue with them. Uh, will this recording be available before the next session? Jason, yes, absolutely it will be. I think it normally 
takes about a day or so for these to get up and online, uh, but we will have these up. Uh, from uh, Pitru, uh, let's see, when is it recommended to have a clustered index on a primary key? And when should we have a non-clustered index on a primary key? Uh, that is a great question. So um, I'm going to give a plug to my buddy Jason Street. Uh, Jason wrote a fabulous book on indexing for APRESS. Uh, really, really good folks over there. And um, he's doing a presentation on indexes coming up that month, next month. So I, I think that he's going to cover a lot of things. Uh, this is very specific to the primary key. So one of the things I'll toss out is a primary key is a constraint. If you know that you're going to have now, first off, the basis for a clustered index, normally the best clustered index, is narrow, static, and ever-increasing. Um, an integer is one of my favorite primary keys. If you know you're going to get more than 2.4 billion rows, up to 2.5, I, I prefer to go with a big int. Uh, the big int is just because I've mathematically sat there and looked at it with my team. If you insert 100 million rows per second, uh, you would take all of recorded human history to be able to run out of a big int if you increment by one. So if you know you'll get more than 2.4 billion rows, uh, go with a big int. Uh, it's eight bytes instead of four bytes, so there's a little extra storage charge, but you should be safe to go with it. Now the primary key specifically is a constraint. The primary key says that I, you cannot have any duplicate values whatsoever. For the reason to put a primary key on a non-clustered index would be, for example, something like an order detail table. If you're going to be constantly querying that um, instead of sales ID based off of orders, or, or, or even orders table if you're looking at order date, you may find that you'll get a benefit if you put um, your clustered index on your order date. I, I've seen this happen before uh, in certain lookup tables, especially for, for line item scenarios, instead of having it on an index. The clustered index does a logical sort of the data based off of that key. And I say logical because if the pages get out of order, your B tree will have a pointer that tells you what row to get to to get to specific pages, but they may be located at different portions of the index. It could be fragmentation, which a rebuild operation will get rid of. So um, I would say the reason to have a primary key on a clustered index is only if it makes sense that that value will ne uh, always be increasing, never have duplicates, and that's the best search predicate predicate for your queries. To have a non-clustered index with the primary key constraint is just that you needed to put the data in a different physical order to be able to satisfy your queries. Um, I, I hope that solved your question. If it did not, shoot me an email and we'll talk back and forth on it a little more. Uh, let's see, Mike. Uh, Bradley, I found this information very interesting, but I'm having troubles uh, where it would be applicable. Can you give me real world examples? Uh, Mike, I, I hope I did that uh, with the write ahead logging. Uh, just trying to understand what the overhead is going to be. Uh, one of the ways you could certainly apply that is to think about an index rebuild. An index rebuild is a lot of operation. So if you have a lot of data in your table and you wonder why your transaction log grows, it would be because of write ahead logging. You have to write the changes to every single record uh, as they are um, as they are changed and pages are rebuilt. Uh, does it matter if bar chart columns are mixed throughout the table or only at the end? I, Glenn, ninety percent of the time, I would say no. Um, I, I think that, that you're going to be just fine if, if you put those columns anywhere that you want. Like I said, it's only a very rare case where you know those columns would be null. And if you know those columns are going to be null, why would you put them in your table? So it's, it's a very, very rare case I would ever see that. But it's, that is like the 1% uh, reason to, uh, to put bar chart as definitions at the end of your, of your table. Let's see. Uh, Lee, hey, Lee, how you doing? Uh, not seen it either, but was curious. Oh, okay, excellent. Uh, hey, it was great seeing you in Tampa as well, Jason. Uh, let's see. Um, do we have to remove forwarding and forwarded by rebuilding the heap table only? Yes. Uh, hey, unfortunately, uh, that's the only way to get rid of fragmentation in a heap. Uh, we do not have a, a way right now to do a reorganize within a heap. It's only a rebuild operation.